The show opens with our protagonist, Dan Chase, a former CIA operative and Afghanistan veteran who has been living off the grid in Connecticut for 30 years. He often has visions of his wife, Abby, sitting hunched on the bathroom floor. These visions feel like flashbacks to the time when his wife was suffering from Huntington's disease, which eventually took her life. Dan looks and lives like a normal person with his two dogs, affectionately named Dave and Carol. He also has a daughter named Emily, who lives off town in an unknown location. Most days, Dan interacts with Emily over the phone while playing fetch with his dogs. However, he has a strange habit of microwaving his phone after ending the call with his daughter. One day, as he's returning home, he notices a shop owner who is new to the place. This makes Dan suspicious of him, so as soon as he reaches home, he ties a couple of cans with a rope and hangs them by his door. That night, he sleeps with a gun and a torch by his nightstand. Suddenly, Dan is woken up by the sound of the cans rustling. As his dogs run downstairs, he follows them slowly with a gun in hand. Dan then finds the same man from the shop lying on the floor, held hostage by the dogs. He's unable to discern the identity of the man, so he does something shocking. Dan shoots him dead and then rearranges the body and the gun to make the tussle look like an equal fight for the police. After skillfully dodging the police's questioning, he drives away from the town and calls Emily to inform her about the situation. In the next scene, assistant director of the FBI, Harold Harper, builds Lego structures with his grandson. He's unable to keep his emotions in check after learning that his grandson is still waiting for his parents to come back home. This leads to him breaking down in the bathroom. After a while, he receives a call from CIA agent Raymond Waters, who wants to talk about something important. Turns out, one of Harold's old cases concerning an agent named Dan Chase, who went missing in action in 1987, seems to have resurfaced. Waters has been instructed to learn whether the agent was still alive, and if so, to retrieve him. Harold tries to reassure him that the case about Dan has been resolved. However, it's obvious that Harold had a close relationship with Dan, which is exactly why the CIA wants to reopen the case. Meanwhile, Dan stops at a nearby cafe after feeling satisfied that he's put enough distance between himself and the town. He calls a man, asking about a house, which seems to be another property he owns under the fake name Dixon. He then instructs the man to bring in groceries and clean up the room before hanging up. After a while, Dan's eyes fall on a woman sitting alone at a corner table, which brings in memories from his past. In the flashback, a younger Dan discusses with Abby the idea of creating new identities and going underground together as a married couple. Back in the present, Dan gets another phone call on his burner phone. The call is from Harold, who apparently knows about his location. He alerts Dan to the transponder attached to the rear wheelbase of his car and informs him that he has three minutes before a cavalry of FBI agents arrives to take him. Alarmed, Dan immediately leaves the cafe and calls back. Through their conversation, it's revealed that Harold and Dan had been close in the past. A few decades ago, they worked together on a dangerous mission in Afghanistan. Harold reveals that he's been instructed to aid the FBI in capturing Dan because Faraz Hamzad wants to settle an old grudge. Faraz was an Afghan warlord, fighting against the Russian troops when both Dan and Harold were working in Afghanistan for the US government. After the war was over, Faraz started working for the FBI and immigrated to the US. He now has great influence inside the FBI. However, it's not clear why he's been pursuing Dan. Frustrated and angry, Dan calls Emily and informs her about the recent development. From their conversation, it's revealed that she has a vague idea about what her father's job was. Following the phone call, Dan loses the trail and knowingly throws the transponder off the side of a service road, hoping to ambush the agents that are following him. Soon afterwards, the FBI cavalry finds the transponder. Suddenly, Dan drives his SUV and bashes their car from the side. After killing almost all members of the cavalry, he faces the last remaining agent. Unfortunately, he can't outsmart the officer and is eventually captured. He's then handcuffed and placed in the back seat, but as they drive away, Dan's dogs start following the car.
The agent then calls Waters, telling him that the target is neutralized. But before he can reveal more, Dan regains some strength and kicks him in the head. This causes the car to steer uncontrollably and get into an accident. Dan's dogs then arrive at the scene and brutally kill the agent. In the aftermath, Dan pulls himself away from the site of the accident. He then calls Harold and warns him that should any more men be sent after him, they will be returned in body bags. In a flashback, a young version of Harold stands in the middle of a desert. Soon afterwards, a young Dan approaches him on horseback. From their conversation, it's clear that Dan wants to help a sect of Afghan revolutionaries fighting against the Russians. However, Harold remains unconvinced about this, as the US intelligence's information about the group doesn't look good. Nonetheless, he agrees to help Dan with one condition. If anyone finds out what Dan is doing, the government won't hesitate to send someone after him. This scene then transforms to the present, where the older Harold is at the crash site where Dan had killed several FBI agents. In the meantime, Dan abandons his wrecked car in an empty garage and gathers his belongings in a bag. He then drives away in a new car to a different location than he had earlier planned. On the way, he rents a house in a regular neighborhood under the fake name of Peter Caldwell. After a while, Dan enters the house with the help of a key hidden below the doormat. The police officer Zoe notices him and arrives at the spot. She inquires about his identity to check if he's an intruder. However, Dan introduces himself as Peter Caldwell. Zoe is suspicious as his face has several bruises. Furthermore, upon seeing his two dogs, she asks him to leave because it violates the property's no-pet policy. Meanwhile, Harold disembarks from a plane and drives up to the mansion of his friend Morgan Boat. He wants to learn why Faraz Hamzad has decided to resurface after so many years. It's revealed that Boat had been a mentor to both Harold and Dan during their younger days in the CIA. He also had been very critical of the duo's actions in Afghanistan. Boat reveals that Faraz now has connections in the US State Department, which he's using as leverage to capture Dan for revenge. Although Boat doesn't expand further, it's clear that the issue between Faraz and Dan is personal. He then gives Harold a phone number of an assassin named Julian, but he warns Harold to use it only when there's no other option left. Elsewhere, Dan, who is now using the name Peter, attempts to get Zoe to his good side by cooking a meal for her. She eventually lets him stay, on the condition that he pays her two months' rent in advance. Our hero sees this as a win-win situation, so he gladly agrees. In the meantime, Harold returns to his office and instructs his agents to meet him. There, his protege Angela asks what he's doing back at the office after having suffered the loss of his son and daughter-in-law. But Harold instructs her to stop worrying about him and then recruits her and another agent to locate the whereabouts of Dan's daughter. Harold had no clue that Dan had a daughter until the latter slipped up the information during their conversation. Later, Agent Waters tries to trick Angela into revealing Harold's motivations. He reveals that the Afghan warlord, Faraz Hamzad, made himself even more formidable due to the presence of his right-hand man, an assassin responsible for killing dozens of Russian targets. Waters believes in the rumors that this man might have been Dan Chase. When Angela asks what this has to do with her mentor, Waters informs her that Harold was stationed chief there, overseeing CIA support in the area. He strongly believes that Harold had backed Dan up. While the information is new for Angela, she refuses to turn against her boss. But Waters informs her that it's only a matter of time until she betrays Harold. Elsewhere, we see Dan and Zoe spending the night together at the latter's house. However, Dan dreams of Abby again, where she taunts him that he's afraid to move on and find another partner. As soon as Dan wakes up the next morning, he starts packing his bags, deciding to get away from this place. However, when he goes to say goodbye to Zoe, he sees that she's flustered and emotional. Zoe reveals that her son wasn't allowed to sit for the exams because his tuition fees hadn't been paid. When Zoe checked her bank account, she found that it had been overdrawn by $41, causing her check to bounce. She claims that this is a ploy by her husband to get out of his alimony payments. Dan offers to pay, but she turns him down. 
Undeterred, he cleans the broken glass off the floor and then starts cooking a meal. Zoe then walks up to him and rests her head on his shoulder. At the FBI office, an officer informs Harold that Dan's daughter, Emily Chase, had committed suicide in 2003. This information leaves Harold shocked. However, Angela soon interrupts him and reveals that Agent Waters had told her about Faraz Hamzad. She then asks whether the rumors are true. In response, Harold tries to deflect the question by saying that no one has any answers for it. That night in a parking lot, Harold calls Julian, the assassin recommended to him by Morgan Boat. He instructs him to find Dan at the house of a woman named Zoe and gives him the address. But he also warns him that Dan is dangerous and would do anything to protect himself. It is then revealed that Harold got the information regarding Dan's whereabouts through a photo captured by an anonymous source. A flashback sequence details Dan's meeting with the mysterious Faraz Hamzad. While grateful for his assistance, Faraz remains unsure of his motivations for joining their cause. Dan tries to convince Faraz to allow him to support their cause and fight against the Russians. However, Faraz insists that his approval isn't enough, and Dan must convince his wife, Balur, as well. Soon afterwards, a camel carrying Faraz's wife enters the camp where the two men are having a conversation. As she removes the cloth covering her face, it's revealed that Balur is none other than Dan's future wife, Abby. As the months passed, the two fell in love and planned to escape with the help of Harold. After their escape was successful, Balur changed her name to Abby and settled down in an off-grid life with Dan. This is perhaps why Faraz is on the hunt for our hero. In the present, Dan prepares to leave Zoe and head to Montana. He reveals how he was part of a war that was unsanctioned by the US government. Without going into details, he then tells her that he had done something serious, which has now put him in the bad books of a lot of people. He also tries to convince Zoe to come with him. Their conversation is interrupted by a call from Emily. To Dan's surprise, she requests to talk with Zoe. Zoe warily takes the phone and listens as Emily tries to explain why she shouldn't trust Dan. The scene quickly shifts to a parking lot where the face behind the voice of Emily is revealed. In a shocking twist, we get to know that Emily is none other than Harold's protege, Angela. It turns out Harold has no idea that his protege is actually the daughter of Dan Chase. Meanwhile, Emily has been working for the FBI under the fake identity of Angela. Back at Zoe's house, she is enraged that Dan lied to her. Feeling hurt, she demands that he leave by the time she returns from an errand. She then walks out of the house, only to break down in tears. But her crying is interrupted by something cracking against her window. She sees the dogs in Dan's car getting excited and trying to get out. As she walks closer to the window, she notices Dan struggling against an assailant who had sneaked up on him. The assailant is revealed to be Julian, who manages to knock Dan out after a hard fight. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Zoe frees the dogs, who then immediately attack Julian. They pin him to the ground until Dan recovers and shoots Julian with a silencer. Just then, a CIA drone shows up and tries to map out the neighborhood. In response to this, Dan assembles his sniper rifle and shoots the drone without breaking a sweat. In flashbacks, we see a young Dan trying to convince Balur about his motivations. However, she remains skeptical, still not convinced how he would be useful in their cause. Balur then reveals that her perception of Americans has changed from the hopeful faces of young people to the cunning bureaucrats of the CIA. For her, Americans are of two types. The first are naive ones who are ready to commit to any cause to make it better, and the second are the pragmatic monsters who will stop at nothing to achieve their goal even if they have to commit unspeakable violence. Right now, she's unable to distinguish which of the two sides Dan is on. In the present, Dan drives a car to a secluded spot. However, he stops to check something in his trunk when the camera cuts to black. Although it's not shown outright, it can be inferred that Dan has taken Zoe hostage unwillingly to keep her safe. The CIA already knows his location, and thus Zoe's life is in danger. On the other hand, Julian's body is also missing from the site of the fight. 
This means the assassin is still alive and out for blood, determined to finish the job for his reputation. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notifications, and leave 2,000 likes or 200 comments if you'd like us to continue part two. Thank you.